Welcome to Energy Radio. This is a big one. This is episode 50. And for this episode, I've invited back our first guest, the one and only, the founder of CEM, uh, our Vice President of CO2 Reductions, Martin Lunson. Martin, welcome. Thanks, Matt. Do you have uh, memories of being on episode 001 of Energy Radio? <laughs> Unfortunately, I do not, which is really sad. Uh, yeah, I wish I could remember I guess I should listen to it again. It's, no, it's okay. You don't have to listen to your own content. It was, it was a great conversation about kind of the origin of CEM. We actually had you on a couple times after that to talk about some of the core values. And, um, so thank you for carving out time and, and coming back on. Um, this is a, a, a big uh, milestone, a lot of hard work into these episodes. And um, kind of wanted to talk a little bit, you know, it's the 50th episode. It's also um, CEM is going to celebrate 20 years as a firm, which is kind of a big deal. Did you ever think when you started in your basement that mm. you'd get to 20 years? Never, ever, never, never ever, no. I'm, I'm thankful that we're here, that we got through 20 years of a lot of growth, a lot of challenges, and well, that we are where we are. Very thankful. Yes. Um, yeah, many, I think the stats indicate that many new businesses don't <coughs> get past like five years. Like that's mm -hmm. kind of the statistical. So any anything, um, I prepped you a little bit, but Maybe I'm putting you on the spot. Any kind of anything stick out of the, any high points of those uh, 20 years? Well, the first one that comes to mind immediately is that uh, someone who I respected at one point in time said I wouldn't survive past two years. <laughs> so I offered a very, very grateful. <laughs> Would you like to call them out on the show? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, so I very thought, but uh, yeah, those customers that we were able to serve well and help them achieve certain key goals that are still very happy today. Uh, th those are you know, some really big memories. What, what were some of those, like in those early days, we're talking 2001, two, three, what were some of the, you know, now we're doing a lot of power gen and co-gen and stuff, but what, what kept you and the team busy in those early years? Uh, yeah, in those early years, a lot of it was studies where we were helping customers look at their metrics because uh, they were under the watchdog of their, say, their parent company. Uh, where were they? Where were their metrics falling behind, and where could we help them get back to either a unit energy use or a unit energy cost where they needed to be to okay. stay competitive? Uh, we did a, a lot of those audits and studies in those years. Um, you know, obviously the first one that really comes to mind for me is London Health Sciences where you know, we were able to design a, a whole new powerhouse for them, um, standalone powerhouse. Um, but going back to the early years... Um, it was more the EM of CEM, right? Yeah, the, the, the energy was, management stuff. So this is pre-fracking, pre pre-green energy, green economy act, pre-grants. It was mostly studies in the energy management field, yeah, right. Okay. That's right. And, and the drivers there were, you know, you said pre-fracking, so we're, you know, we're still high gas prices. High gas prices. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, where a lot of Ontario subsidiaries of American parents were falling behind, frankly, on either unit energy use or unit energy cost, and okay. were under a lot of pressure to find ways to come back to say best in their division or best amongst their competitors. That was a lot of the early work, yep. And my sense is that that was something that was still, like now you talk, you have energy managers through through different funding programs. Like it's it's almost you know, like safety where it's, you know, it's part of the, the, the day to day. But, but back then was it still something where it wasn't, everybody wasn't doing it yet. It was, it was, it was the early adopters were pushing yeah, it. Yeah, it was, a lot of companies in those years were still making, you know, such healthy returns. Energy wasn't, uh, you know, as big a cost center. Uh, it wasn't under the microscope. It wasn't a priority. Uh, emissions was hardly not on the radar at all at mm. that time. Um, so no, it, it was it was generally the minority of the clients who were really you know really concerned with managing those energy metrics and because co you know when it looked at the big buckets labor raw materials were much bigger buckets in terms of cost of goods sold than energy was so um, yeah so so were you were you finding yourself banging the door in in a lot of places or or were you able to kind of uh, cater to those who, who saw it like were you having to 
be a bit more evangelical, so to speak, in your message? Yeah, it was hard to find customers. Like, for example, the automotive plants, they would often say to me, oh, well, energy is less than 5% of cost of goods sold, so why would we spend a lot of time on that? Uh -huh. So it was usually the pulp and paper mills, the food and beverage plants, where energy was, say, t between 10 and 20% of cost of goods sold. They cared about it. Um, but yeah, it was hard to find customers who were under the pre under pressure to do something about energy cost or energy use. Right, right. Um, hmm. and, and you know, a lot of the big energy intensive businesses here in Niagara that are no longer here, one of the contributing factors was that their energy use was just simply too high. Hmm. Hmm. Um, Interesting. So you mentioned uh, a minute ago London Health Sciences, which you know when I joined you was was an anchor client. Um, talk to us a bit about you know how do you get in there, and then you know I think that powerhouse story is cool because it it has ties back into your pre CEM days, and then that was a, a big project for all of us here. And talk to us a bit about that. That's kind of an era to itself in the twenty years of CEM, I think. And, but I think it, it does um, point to something that I think is still important for us, and that is um, helping customers realize that we have their best interests at heart, where we can build a relationship with, we become an extension of them, they realize that we're utterly sincere about helping them uh, stay out of trouble, achieve their goals, and London Health Sciences was an example of that. We could, we were. We built a very strong relationship with us, with them. They trusted us, mm -hmm. um, and we went to the wall to help them. And so, yeah, f finding those kind of customers with whom we can build strong, effective relationships with—that's mm -hmm. uh, that was an example of that. Yeah. Even before that, even when we served Holyoke Gas and Electric in, back in the 2001, 2003 era. There again, we, we were able to build a really strong right. relationship with our client. And, and when you come into that powerhouse in London, y you had been there before, like the, you mm -hmm. had history there, right? Yeah, I had a lot of history. We, I had done a five megawatt turbine there between 93 and 98. Um, so yeah, we knew the, the original powerhouse well. We knew the old EFW plant there well. Mm. Um, but yeah, already at that time in the early 2000s, they needed a thermal power engineer, and they realized that this was our core competency, that the engineers around them in the London area didn't have that kind of ability to mm. help them in the areas where they needed right. expertise in boilers or steam turbines or gas turbines. Now, one of the when you talk about areas of expertise, in addition to thermal power, one of the areas of expertise that you bring and I think have taught the rest of us is that project development uh, piece, and, and we talk about these steps, and we have mm -hmm. this stairway to heaven graphic that we've mm -hmm. created in terms of what it takes to get a project uh, approved. Can we pause there and talk a bit about about that in terms of your, because it's been it's been a real clarity of vision uh, mm -hmm. for you in terms mm -hmm. of a lot of these uh, energy users aren't used to developing projects from an idea through to. Mm -hmm. Completion. Um, can you walk us in general terms through some of the stages? Well, I think that starts with asking the customer a lot of questions, listening to what their short term, medium term, long term needs are, and responding accordingly. Um, making sure that you know we serve them from a position of humility, where we know what they need, say for the next board meeting or for the next meeting, where our our customers meeting with his boss, um, and you know, always uh, being focused on what their immediate problem is, knowing mm -hmm. what their problem is, and then you know, coming up with just discrete work packages that are not so costly, but will help them undertake their fatal flaw analysis. It's basically fatal. You know, we became really proficient at fatal flaw, like what is technically feasible, what's financially feasible, and is it really implementable? Mm. Um, what are some of those fatal flaws that, in your experience, you've seen you know, make a job go sideways for, for a thermal power job? Yeah, I, I think it's, well, that's a good question. Um, I think it sort of falls into three buckets. It, the first bucket is, not having people sort of at 
at the ground level who really are willing to advance or sell internally the right solution. Um, another, another key area is not having support on high. Mm. We've certainly seen that many times over the 40 years where... You mean like divine intervention <laughs> on, on high? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> In the executive wing where okay. we didn't have an executive sponsor. Uh, you know, if you look back at all the projects I've been involved with, there's been somebody, there's not only been a proponent at the lower levels, but there's been a a really strong proponent who believed in that, you know, that local presence who was willing to advance the idea. And then, and then the other area is really, uh, you know, those forces outside the energy user that maybe we didn't understand well enough that, you know, can make a project go sideways, um, where we didn't do it, we didn't pay enough attention to certain key organizations outside the customer who who could have a direct effect on the project. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that, that, that champion at the corporate level, like uh, we're working on a job right now where it's a no-brainer that they mm -hmm. should be doing it, and the folks at the local level understand, mm -hmm. but nobody's captured the vision at the higher level, and it's, the project's not going anywhere. And I think too often I've been naive where I thought, I believed so strongly in the ability of the local person, and I should have spent an equal or even greater amount of time at the corporate level because unfortunately at the corporate level if it's not the corporate level guy's idea it's probably not a good idea so um, yeah there's been way too many MBA case studies where I've worked with the local people without simultaneously serving the corporate people mm -hmm. uh, and I think we're getting better at that mm -hmm. uh, so cool so You've kind of, in the last year, we've kind of done a bit of a transition here and, and we've kind of uh, switched chairs, so to speak. Um, you know, now that you're in your, your new role, what, what are, not, not, we're going to talk about the role in a minute, but, mm -hmm. you know, what are some things that you're kind of, um, that, are, that are different for you now in, in, your, in your new role in terms of not, no longer being the principal in charge? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you miss it? Do you... Oh, I uh, don't miss it at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy because I'm doing what I just love to do, which I did back in the early 2000s, which I've done for most of the 20 years before that, which is just focus only on the customer. Mm. Uh, I don't have any distractions with any. I can just focus on what does the customer need this week? What do they need next week? What's the best possible deliverable I can produce for them mm. so that they look really good at that meeting. Uh, n but no, I'm, I'm having the time of my life because I'm just doing what I love to do, which is help customers look good, help, you know, help them aspire to their goals, um, help keep a plant competitive, uh, help a, an organization meet their metrics. So no, I, I, <laughs> I should <laughs> say that I, that I don't miss the, the challenges of organizational life. And making no, making all. payroll every two weeks and yeah, I don't deal, know. dealing with uh, yeah well let's so let's talk about the new role um, <laughs> vice president of CO two reductions mm. I love the love the title I'm excited about you know what's going to come out of it um, what 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 do you see as the role like what you know uh, that's a very good question I think the the role is to get uh, in front of the right customers early on and help them choose the right pathway in discrete steps that will help them achieve their CO2 reduction targets. Hmm. Um, trying to convince them that they should work with us to build that carbon roadmap and that they can trust us to come up with the right technologies hmm. in the right stages. Um, you know, unfortunately, there's customers that are so either in panic mode or zealous mode. Mm. They're jumping into certain uh, solutions that now they're realizing was premature or mm. not properly thought out. Um, but yeah, it's being really, really careful about which technologies we put in front of customers. Mm. Um, because there's a lot of technology from the Pacific Rim and, the, and from Europe to transfer to Canada and to the States. Um, and it's making sure that we advise them you know, very well um, on the best technologies to help them achieve those CO2 reduction goals. 
you know, when I think of 10 years ago when we were... If I could just add to something, sure. sorry. You know, there's this propensity with electrification, like everything electrification, and it, is that real? Let's, let's just take a step back and, th and ask ourselves, is that really the best way? Right. Uh, and is there, like, let's think through all the implications of that. Yeah. Um, well, it, it strikes me as, and maybe you want to talk a bit about the initiative you're working on a little bit, but... Like w when we were, you know, 10 years ago when we started doing, or maybe eight years ago, doing a lot of cogen, we were, you know, and, and that was a narrower field, but we were trying to figure out, you know, is it a gas turbine or an engine? Is it a, you know, and, and how big it is? Is it, what's the heat recovery? Mm -hmm. But, but our, our field of choices was pretty narrow. Yeah. My sense, you know, staying close to what you're doing is that's very different now. Yes, it's very different now. There is just such a wide range of technologies being developed that are available. Uh, the, the, the pace of the development is stunning. Hmm. You know, if we familiarize ourselves with the technology readiness level, you know, from one to nine, uh, the pace of some of this development is, so the options that are available are, are staggering. So well, on the one hand, it's very exciting. On the other hand, it's very overwhelming. Uh -huh. uh, um, and finding the customers that are willing to work with us on risks and risk management. Uh, mm. You know, there's different risk levels associated with different technologies. Um, so it's a very challenging time, but it's also an, you know, an extremely exciting time. So you mentioned there's, there's many technologies and they're developing quickly. Like what, what do you, what, why, has it always been that way? Or, or like what, what's, what's caused that um, to happen I, in this I, ecosystem? I think there's just a worldwide acknowledgement that we we all collectively have to do something about the okay. environment. Um, <clears throat> and unlike the EU, unlike the Pacific Rim, we're, we're in a bit of, bit of a challenging situation here in Canada. You know, we, we have a very lofty goal of being 30% below 2005 levels by 2030. Okay. And as of yesterday, we are only 1% really? below. Whoa. Um, the, Canada came out and announced that, like we have, a, a lot to do between now and 2030 if we're going to meet our Paris uh, Accord objective. Right. Um, there's a lot of talk about money being made available. Uh, we're not seeing it flow very well yet. So let's let's talk. Let's <laughs> let's. Pause. I'm gonna I'm gonna wade into some potentially dangerous territory. Um, we're we're recording this before the federal budget is going to get launched, but I think it'll probably release after so we'll uh, we'll rewind the tape and see uh, see how right you were but you know I know you have your own feelings on our current uh, federal government uh, I'll leave that there um, but what's what's your if, if you were prime minister for a day mm -hmm. if you were in that chair or you were the or you were the you know minister of environment like this is your opportunity to kind of wax philosophically or you know if you had the magic wand like what how would you drive us forward towards those goals? I would make the program delivery uh, more efficient and clearer. Hmm. You know, if you think back to how over the years since the 80s, like since 1986 when I got my first $100,000 grant for a customer, like the, the Ontario Ministry of Energy in those years, the province of Ontario in general, even the IESO programs, they're clear. Right. They're, they're predictable. Okay. Um, I hate to say it, but anything with the federal government is is it's it's unbelievably onerous to apply. Uh, it almost takes more man hours to you know to get the incentive than it does to actually do the work. Okay. Um, so so the program rollout deters a lot of people, and hmm. and so that I wish that the you know the money could be made available through the provinces. Uh -huh. um, you know through as opposed to through the federal government, the, hmm. the bureaucracy. I shouldn't say this on camera, but the bureaucracy is just overwhelming and off-putting to many customers. Interesting. Uh, so there's 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 announcements of money there, uh, but those who would m put it to the best use maybe aren't the ones at the front of the line because of the red tape. Like the big announcement yesterday from the CIB, um, that was a Fortis company that did that. Now you know that took a lot of effort by that subsidiary. There's many organizations that have great projects that. Could you could pull 100,000, 200,000 tons a year of CO2 out, but can they put in the amount of effort that it takes? Hmm. So the, 
I, you know, I think the, the money that's being set aside is, they're sending the right signals there. Right. But the, but the actual rollout, uh, because many of these CO2 reduction projects require, you know, pretty close to 50%, somewhere between 20 and 50% incentives. Aha, uh -huh. to, to, to make them pencil to, out. To make them pencil out. Uh, many companies are willing to put in 50%. Okay. Um, if the gov government's that serious about reading, reaching our 2030 target of 30% below 2005 levels, we, we have work to do. Um, so, you know, the government often gets in trouble because they, they, they pick winners sometimes, mm -hmm. right, in terms of technology. What, how would you kind of handle if you had the, the, the checkbook, you know, how would you optimize and, and, and try to get the most uh, bang for your buck? I think it's a, a combination of uh, capital cost efficiency in terms of you know, a, a reasonable number of dollars per ton of CO2 removed, something that's, that's comparable to what the government is charging for carbon. So if, as they go from $30 a ton to $170 a ton, does the capital cost, is it in the same ballpark mm. as what the carbon charge is? So is it, is it capital cost efficient and is the technology uh, in a state of readiness where it's not going to become, you know, a white elephant uh -huh. project and just okay. sit there and rust in the corner? Okay. Um, I, I really think we need to look to the EU. The EU is just like really far ahead in many of these technologies and we're not transferring them to Canada quickly enough, I think. Mm. Um, so if it was you, you'd, you'd, you'd ask the applicants to say, well, how much money are you going to spend? You're going to spend $10 million and, and, and you divide that by the GHGs reduced over, over the year? Over the useful life of the equipment. Okay. Somewhere like say 20 years. Okay. If it's going to reduce, you know, if, say it's 10,000 uh, tons a year times 20 years, um, you know, 200,000 tons put that in the, in the denominator. You know, if that, if it comes out to say 20, 30, $50 per ton of CO2 removed, right. it's, a, it's a capital efficient project. Okay. And, and it needs to be material. Like, you know, the, the large final emitters are in that 50,000 tons a year range. You know, are we, are we helping the big emitters? I see, I uh, see. Or are we gonna just go EVs across Canada and, and hardly make a dent? Aha, uh -huh. right? okay, okay. We can, we can electrify all the cars. Right. But as the, President and CEO of Hydro One recently said, like, they've got lots of capacity for EVs. Mm. It, it's, it's not, you know, the amount of tons reduced, it, it's important, but our customers could contribute a lot more to the Paris right. Accord commitment by 2030. One of the phrases that I'm seeing a lot, and I, we haven't talked about this, so I hope we're okay here, but this, Mark Carney's in a little bit of hot water uh, with, with his new uh, company around, uh, Avoided emissions. Have you been following this story where there's this there's a difference between on the accounting side of avoided emissions, like you're you're avoiding future emissions as opposed to reducing emissions that you're making today. Have you been following that whole narrative? No, no? I'm more in, I'm more following the customers who are accountable for so many tons now. Right, and then they apply 170 dollars a ton. Yep. And they're saying, "Oh shit, that's way too much money." Right. So I'm, we're focused on those customers who are going to see the direct financial impact right. five years from now. Say. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. And they're also worried that if Trudeau calls a snap election, wins a majority, raises it above $170 a ton, whoa, which is widely forecast now, really, with his majority government. So we're focused on those customers who are like a little bit in panic mode. Hmm. Um, hmm. Interesting. They're seeing a huge uh, financial hit to them. And, and when you sit in front of, or <coughs> sit across the table from clients, because there's kind of these, these two motivators, there's, there's, the, there's the governments who are driving stuff, and then hmm. there's this whole um, narrative around where the money's coming and the banks, and the banks saying, we're not gonna underwrite you know, uh, dirty assets. When you sit in, you know, and so that would come through the the the, the C suite and stuff. Like, is is it both driving it? Is is one driving it harder? What are you hearing in terms of the, the motivators? I, th the strongest motivators are the clients themselves who are, who from the board of directors levels, have, you know, documented have have goals. Okay. They're, and they're very clear about those goals. And they're serious about those goals. Um, 
th those are the ones that we are kind of drawn to right now where they're dead serious about say going from 60,000 tons a year to 30,000 tons a year in five years uh -huh. and they they are serious and they will hold their plant managers accountable for achieving you know that say 50 uh, so no it's more it's more the it's coming from the hmm. at, from the corporate level okay, okay. Yeah. but pretty soon the way we're going it'll be showing up on their bills right in it will be showing up on their bills and they're uh, because it, our government, unlike some, are sending out clear signals about carbon cost. That's a that's a good thing that Trudeau has done. Okay. Um, so people, kn they're going to respond accordingly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So as of two weeks ago, we are at forty dollars a ton in Canada as yeah. the floor price. Mm -hmm. We're going to one seventy. Let's let's get into some of the technology now. Like what what are some of the technologies making sense at forty fifty bucks a ton? We'll start there, and then we'll move up from there. Well, the, yeah, the, the two that come to mind immediately are the ones where we have real core competency, which is the biomass and the biogas. Um, they, they, they pencil out right now at that, hmm. at that kind of... The, the hydrogen technologies, whether it's green hydrogen or blue hydrogen, um, CCUS, carbon capture utilization and storage, don't pencil out yet at, at that. They, they're they closer to, the, say, the $100 a ton. So let's unpack those each one by one and <coughs> let's get a time check on the uh, hydrogen, first hydrogen reference. We always play a little game how, how long into the podcast before we hear hydrogen for, for the first time. So I got a text, a little shout out to uh, one of our listeners, uh, Peter Ferrado of Holler Mechanical in Windsor. He helped us build oh. that plant. He texted me the other day and he said, uh, I hit something with a dead cat. And it was an obscure reference, and then I realized, often I'll say on the podcast, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting somebody who's talking about hydrogen. So it was his cryptic way as a listener of telling me that he had talked hydrogen in his uh, comings and goings. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty cool. So mm -hmm. uh, thanks to Peter for continuing to listen. But um, mm -hmm. let's unpack biogas, biomass, like maybe not the technology, but where would, if somebody implements that, like, and they're in Canada or in Ontario, where do they see that in terms of the savings? Like, walk us through where that would benefit them. Are they selling something? Are they reducing costs? Like, how does that yeah, work? Yeah, they're they're either using a solid fuel like biomass or an organic source that they can make biogas out of. And in our in the Ontario setting, unlike the Alberta Saskatchewan setting, um, or other you know jurisdictions that are still burning gas. And on the Ontario setting, that's making that fuel and directly displacing natural gas in boilers, mostly, uh, so that they are re directly reducing the natural gas consumption. In Alberta or Saskatchewan, that's different, where we can also make power and have meaning meaningful CO2 reduction via displaced power. Right, okay. Um, so in Ontario, they're displacing natural gas and the, the, the $40 a ton shows up in most cases, it shows up on the natural gas bill from Enbridge in this right. case? Right, it does. Okay. Yeah, okay. It's a so they're, they're, they're investing money, they're buying a different fuel, or they're creating, or they're reusing their waste as, as a, to create a, a displacement fuel. And as a result, they're not buying as much fossil natural gas from Enbridge, which has been burdened by the $40 a ton. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Are there, are, in Ontario, are there some sites that that are paying that forty dollars a ton through other means if you're above a certain level or is everybody paying for it through their gas well there's a few customers that are registered with the federal government through the output based pricing system they're not paying the full 40 bucks there they okay. are getting some acknowledgement for their high efficiency chp okay we have okay. a few customers in that in that category not many customers know about Okay. OBPS, Output Based Pricing System. We're trying to help some customers right now get enrolled in that. Okay. Um, and it's a it's a voluntary program where if you're if you meet the federal criteria, if okay. you're yeah, if you're better than the, um, you you can get almost a fifty percent saving on okay. on your. Okay. But that that will go down over time. Right. Okay. Um, Interesting. And then so and then you, you talked about some hydrogen technologies. Um, What's your, you know, what what's driving, like that? That's is that at a hundred bucks a ton? Like, you know, what's what's talk us through the ecosystem there. Yeah. So the challenge there is to find cost-effective, 
low cost or green electricity to make the hydrogen with right now like so that the the technology that's most readily available is electrolyzers okay but they're very power intensive they can't bear the power cost in Ontario for example so we have to find cheap power or so we have for example we have some some customers who have underutilized cogen assets mm. uh, they could make a megawatt more well we can make a lot of hydrogen with a megawatt more hmm. v very cost effectively so it's f it's finding those customers who can either you know get some green power pretty cheap or make some of their own power very cheap uh, so they we're looking for those early adopters who can make hydrogen on site and use that hydrogen directly in an industrial process right. or in their prime mover, right. for that matter, okay. uh, to uh, reduce their natural gas consumption. Hmm. If we can either buy or make power in that uh, three cent range, yes. we, can, we can start to pencil out hydrogen once we go to say 60 or $70 a ton. Hmm. Uh, for, for carbon really? cost. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Huh. But that presumes we're going to take that cheap, low cost power, make hydrogen, and use it directly in a process. I see. Okay. Like in a boiler. Right. Okay. In a burner. Right. So the fun part right now is working with some of the bo burner OEMs mm. who, who have hydrogen burners already ready to go. Right. Uh, where we can swap a duct burner, say in an HRSG, or swap a burner in a boiler and burn the hydrogen right there. Hmm. Um, so it makes it relatively capital cost efficient. We're right. only talking about the electrolyzer and the hydrogen storage. That's the beauty of hydrogen is it stores so well. Right, uh, so, right. okay. Um, huh. What are some technologies beyond hydrogen that you're, you know, that are maybe not as far down the technology readiness level um, that, you're ex that you're excited about and you, know, you, you were you were pursuing biogas before it was cool. You know what are the other things that you're looking at before they're cool? Yeah, the one that I'm most enamored with right now uh, is CCUS. Even our own federal environment minister, Seamus O'Regan, always talks about net zero. Hmm. I think the Trudeau government is very sensitive to the Alberta Saskatchewan problem and all the natural gas infrastructure. Natural gas is going to be part of the solution. We're not going to electrify the whole country, right? But to burn the natural gas and then capture that CO two, and use it somewhere, I think that's the most exciting area. Mm. Um, the IEA is doing a ton of work in that area. Mm. I'm I'm easily the most excited about CCUS. Really? Yeah. So what are some of the end use? Like we capture that CO two. What are we What are we doing with it? Are we <laughs> yeah, putting right. it in pop? Or are we you know? Right now. Soda for our listeners from Michigan. <laughs> right now, we're unfortunately, we're injecting it deep into the ground. We're okay. sequestering the CO two. Okay. Um, we have a we have a technology provider in Alberta who's actually making soap with it. Really? That's at the small end. Okay. Um, but finding uses for the carbon that's that's a, the CO two is a, is a big finding uses for the CO two. Pardon me, is the big challenge. Okay. But also capturing it. Right. Uh, where is it, where is that technology at? Is it, does it's it work at the big scale, not the small at, scale? Yeah, I think the only commercially available stuff is is very large. Okay. So if you're at a million tons a year, you're a cement plant. Uh, then there's commercially proven, very capital intensive. Hmm. Um, you know, our interest is in those customers between say fifty thousand and two hundred thousand tons of CO two a year. Um, there is work being done for CCUS at mm. that level. Okay. So my main my main area of excitement is tracking that those th that research in the, in Europe primarily but also in the Pacific Rim. Okay. There's a lot of R&D happening in that sort of mid-market where, where our sandbox. Okay. Um, okay. Huh. Let's see if that would be that would be the area that I would be most interested in, I would say. You, you, you unsolicited, you brought up electrification twice now. <laughs> uh, <wait>. <laughs> well, <laughs> clearly, I clearly neither time as a fan. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a fan of electrifying everything, no. No, I, I've been warned about this. I think that's an overly simplistic approach. 
So mm. just like why did wind and solar get so much attention in right. Canada? It was easy to understand. Biomass, mm. biogas, harder to understand. Right. Um, electrification is easy to understand. Right. There's more nuance. There's more. There's there's other solutions. Not all of our customers can electrify everything. Right. The right. grid can't support it. Um, so yes, there. So our approach as CEM to advise our customers is a hybrid approach where there's 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 some electrification in the mix where it makes sense to do so where the infrastructure exists to to provide those amps okay and to use those amps when it's cost effective to do so but it's not the only solution it's a mm. hybrid mm. Um, mm. and I'm also very efficient uh, or very excited about some energy management strategies mm. at point of use where we can also help customers reduce their CO2 mm. footprint um, you know there's a lot of technology developments at point of use okay so it's not just in the powerhouse or just in the central powerhouse where we where we you know gravitate to right right um, so yeah I see myself and I see CEM as agents of technology transfer like you know Canada's a little bit you know we're 10 or 15 behind years behind the, the European Union advancing that stuff bringing it to Canada helping our customers realize this is very doable um, so, so what are some of the things you're doing to kind of stay on the cutting edge of 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 this? Um, you know, is it is it traveling around Europe and looking at stuff? Is it you know reading magazines? Is it like what 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 are some of the things you're doing? Well, I've got about ten, at least ten, European OEM allies. Okay. And I've developed strong relationships with them over the years. I talk to them a lot. Okay. I'm aware of their activities. Their their own R&D efforts, where they're getting money from from the EU, uh, so it, it's mostly staying very close to say ten or twenty European OEMs that I have very high regard for, who've been in our space and who themselves are making adjustments to this low mm. CO2 environment. Okay, who have to pivot right themselves in terms of their own technology offerings. That's probably my biggest source. Um, I'm also very much encouraged by the Renewable Thermal Collaborative in Washington. I think they're okay. doing great work. Uh, cool. The IEA themselves, the International Energy Agency, is top shelf. And some of our clients are also, you know, very very active. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, especially those that are headquartered in Europe. Okay. They're really active. Mm. Mm. Um, and that's a little bit the challenge that our Canadian customers have is that some of their European head offices are a lot closer to this stuff than they themselves are. Hmm. And that's where we come in to try to help translate some of that stuff. Uh, cool. So as we you know, kind of mindful of time here, like uh, for, a, for a listener, Martin, what can, what can, you know, we talked about, you know, 50 podcasts. We talked about, you know, the 20 year history of CEM and, uh, you know, for somebody who wants to be prepared for the next 20 years and this massive transition we're going to undergo, like what, what can people be doing aside from listening to energy radio, um, <laughs> what else can they be doing to kind of prepare themselves for, for what's coming next? Um, well, definitely talk to us because we're <laughs> staying very close to that. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's to baseline. Like it's, first of all, it's to empower somebody in the organization for whom this is a priority. Hmm. Uh, unfortunately, in Ontario, for example, we don't have as many funded energy managers as we used to. Mm. So um, either empowering somebody in the organization, like the universities are very good at, they have, all the universities have at least one person who's really on this file. Okay. Uh, or empowering someone like us to, to, to baseline, like where are the material uh, creators of CO2 and, wh and where can we, where's the low hanging fruit? Coming up with a five, 10 year or now a, a nine-year roadmap if we're going to achieve 2030 targets. Right. Um, so first, understanding the present situation, then developing a five, ten-year roadmap. Um, yeah, I would say generally stay close to the IEA. I have, mm. a, I, have I respect them a ton. I think they're the they're the best repository of what's all coming down. Mm. They're very timely. They're very proactive. Um, but without knowing exactly you know, what your CO2 contributors are and coming up with a, a plan 
We have quite a few customers who, who are, you know, not, they, they don't know their present situation well enough hmm. and, the, okay. and the options before them. Right on. So hmm. we're looking forward to helping them. Uh, cool. A lot. Awesome. Well, thank you for helping us. Thank you for joining this episode. Hopefully the 50th is more memorable for you than the first one was. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, thank you, Martin, for, hey, for joining us. Uh, always, I didn't always get a chance to talk about the customers that uh, it was so much fun to serve. Oh, okay. Like the ones that, you know, really did amazing things. Well, like, like, like International Wax and Windsor Salt, 3M. We were able to help the three, 3M plants in our own small way stay open. Um, you know, customers like Windsor Salt and International Wax that can just island from the grid, run their plants. Those are the things that give me jollies, right? Like, that's just like, yes. Yeah. Um, well, we had, anyway. uh, I don't know where it's going <laughs> to fall in the queue, but we had Sunnybrook on, uh, two guys from Sunnybrook, and to listen to them talk about, you know, this guy who's, who was ex Gerdau, uh, mm-hmm. electrical engineer, coming to Sunnybrook and, and seeing you know, some of the exciting opportunities for voltage stability and power mm-hmm. quality with his eight megawatt machine. Mm-hmm. Uh, some pretty exciting stuff there. And you look at, you know, you were very involved in Labatt's London. Mm-hmm. You know, that plant is probably only here today mm-hmm. because they mm-hmm. they saw vision and, and, mm-hmm. and made it happen mm-hmm. 30 years ago, right? Yeah, so. so the whole resiliency thing is just so exciting. Anyway, we're, we're done. Cool. Well, thank you, Martin. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Um, we really, really appreciate your your vision and your uh, uh, desire to take a stance on things and, and, and see the future. So, thank you to our listeners. This is episode 50, uh, big milestone. So, thank you to everybody who listens. And uh, as always, give us lots of feedback. Uh, let us know uh, if we have suggestions for guests or um, how we can continue to improve. On behalf of um, Lisa Barber, our executive producer and Mark Charbonneau, the guy who makes us look and sound great. Uh, Martin, thank you for coming. Uh, Thank you to our listeners. Uh, Until next time, uh, stay safe and have fun.